So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our final speaker of the, of the day, and that's uh, Professor Barry Rand from uh, Electrical Engineering and uh, the Enlinger Center. So he's one of the um, joint appointments that have been enabled by uh, the gift and the center. And uh, it's, it's really a pleasure to have him uh, on the faculty. He's uh, doing, as you'll see, uh, some of, I think, you know, the, the most topical and, and impactful research you can be doing in this energy area, and that's, of course, uh, solar energy conversion. So Barry got his start uh, at Cooper Union, and then uh, after earning his BSc there, came here and uh, earned his PhD with Steve Forrest. Some of you may, may know Steve uh, quite well. And then after... <laughs> Rick. <laughs> Be quiet over there. Okay. And then uh, after that, he, he went off to, uh, to, to Imer in Belgium uh, as a research scientist and then came back uh, to join the faculty in 2013. And uh, as you'll see, Barry's uh, been uh, highly productive both uh, in sort of the traditional academic publication sense, but also in the, in the patent space. And I, and I think uh, that's a real testament to the, to the impact of the work uh, that he's been doing. Not surprisingly, he's been recognized with uh, many awards, uh, even at this uh, early stage of his independent career. So he's been recognized by 3M, uh, DuPont, and then most recently by, by DARPA. So uh, with that, uh, Barry, take it away. Thank you, Paul. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak here today, and thank you all for sticking around. I hope I'll give a nice introduction to a poster session as I plug three of my students' posters during the course of this presentation. So my talk today is about thin film energy devices. So first of all, what's a thin film energy device? The two most prominent ones that I work with, though not by any means an exhaustive list, are thin film light emitting devices, and in particular for solid state lighting uses, as well as thin film photovoltaic devices or solar cells. So here's an example of a roll-to-roll -roll coated module of thin film polymer-based organic solar cells. Well, let's start by talking a bit about lighting, and then I'll get into photovoltaics sort of toward the second half of the talk. So it was yesterday Gary Anlinger showed up. Uh, he had a physical compact fluorescent bulb in his hand, but actually the lighting revolution and evolution has been going on for quite a long time, and today's state of the art is represented by the solid state light of uh, gallium nitride-based LED sources. And these have efficiencies of somewhere 80 to 100 lumens per watt. To put that in perspective, the compact fluorescent sits at around 55 lumens per watt. The standard incandescent tungsten type filament sits at 13 lumens per watt. And the, uh, the candle we can't really use on this scale because we're not inputting electrical power. So who understands lighting and their efficiency and the metrics that go along with it? I don't even know why I'm raising my hand, because I don't know I fully understand it. It's quite complicated. I see like three hands up. Let, first, let me give you a little bit of a lighting 101, what this lumens per watt means. So the, the terms that we often use in lighting are color temperature, efficacy, or power efficiency, uh, using the, the, the metric lumens per watt, and the color rendering index, or CRI. So the first thing we need to know is the lighting industry is is uh, sort of centered on comparing the luminaire, the, 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 lu the spectral illumination, to that of our sun. And our sun is a black body. It has a temperature of about 5,800 Kelvin, so the 6,000 K pretty much represents the black body spectrum coming extraterrestrially from the sun to Earth. And we see that it peaks in the visible range. Not surprisingly, our eye is meant to pick up the visible light. And the, uh, when we go to something like an incandescent, that has a temperature of 2700 K. Tungsten is a very impressively thermally robust material. We can see that, that that's what's known as a warm white. So it gives us color, which is pretty much focused in the red. But the thing we can see about that, and the reason why this, this bulb here is so inefficient, is that it peaks out in the infrared at about 1200 nanometers. And that's not good, because our eye doesn't see that. So most of the light coming out of the incandescent bulb is given off as heat, and it's very wasteful. And that's why it's not a very efficient illumination source. Um, so newer luminaires, solid-state lighting, they try to focus all their light coming out in this visible spectrum. And so when we try to understand color temperature, it means what is the spectrum of the light how close is that spectrum of the light emitted from that 
lighting source compared to some temperature of this Planckian, this is Planck's block body, uh, the Planckian locus of this spectrum here. So does the spectrum look closest to this one, which is 5,000 K, or does it look closest to this one, which is 3,000 K? That's what color temperature means. Now, the efficacy, or the power efficiency, is in lumens per watt. And lumens are essentially how much of that light your eye can practically sense. And that's peaking in the green at this 555 nanometers. And so actually the best uh, lumen per watt you can get is just a monochromatic light source at 555 nanometers. And then you can get a lumens per watt up to about 640 or so lumens per watt. Obviously, it's not a good light source because you can't render any colors. You only have green. So a practical light source, you want to have all of these colors. Um, so just by looking at efficacy is not a good metric. So Cree has reported lumens per watt values greater than 300. It's kind of meaningless because it probably means they're only getting a pretty, a pretty poor spectrum in that. And it's, that spectrum is probably just focused in this greenish region. And so when we look at the, the back of our light bulb, here's the 13 lumen per watt, 60 watt light bulb here. It has a color temperature, not surprisingly, the temperature of that tungsten filament, 2700K. And the luminaire from the solid state lighting has obviously a much higher lumens per watt ratio. It's about 90 or so. And they make the color temperature also give about 2700K because it's been found that you don't actually want to have a color temperature of 6,000 when you're indoors. There's a lot of psychology that goes into what's an optimal light source indoors, and it turns out that people like a warm white. They like something that's not uh, excessively in the blue part of the spectrum. And finally, we have the color rendering index. That's basically how well can this light source render all the different colors that we have in our room, in our clothing, in our fruit, in our soda cans, so a very poor light source, um, like that of a fluorescent tube or a sodium discharge lamp that you have in parking lots, cannot render colors very well. And you don't see these colors very well at all. When you go to a better luminaire, like an incandescent or a good solid state lighting, you see that we can render these colors quite well. So that's a little bit of, of lighting 101. Now when it comes to a thin film LED, the thing you have to be conscious of is the films here we're talking about are tens of nanometers thick. I'll show you a... a, a a schematic of one in a, in a moment. And it's almost akin to a fiber optic, that it's a little bit hard to get that, it's a lot bit hard to get that light out. And so the device and the device physicists and chemists in particular, organic chemists, have done a really good job at making organic light emitting devices 100% internally efficient. That means you inject an electron in a hole and there's a 100% likelihood that you're going to get a photon created from that electron in a hole. However, Getting the light out of that structure is another problem. And currently, this sort of thin film structure can't get light out very well. And so the, out, the external quantum efficiency remains sort of 20 to 30 percent, because the out coupling is not unity. And so a, a big problem here is getting this light out. You can see here's a pixel of a green LED. You can see all the light emanating out of the side of the structure. And so the work we're doing is um, being led actually by Kyung Min Lee, who has a poster here this afternoon. I recommend you go see it. Um, and so what we've done is we are taking an approach that's been used before, that of trying to scatter light out of this substrate. So a typical way of doing this, let me just rifle through this, is that if you have some layer outside of your substrate, for example, like this, so the scattering layer here, you impregnate it with some high index particle. And then the index contrast between that high index particle and your background layer can scatter light in all directions, and you give your photons numerous opportunities to get out of that structure. Um, what we thought is that if we're going to move from something like a glass substrate, which is a low index medium, it's, it's fine to use these high index particles to scatter light. But what if we want to work with a flexible substrate? I showed this flexible substrate emitting light, and that's what we eventually want to do. If we do that, flexible substrates made from plastics have higher indis indices of refraction than something like glass. It might be out here. And so then our contrast between these high index scatterers and this high index flexible substrate has reduced. And so we thought, why don't we just flip this on its head 
And instead of impregnating this scattering layer with high index materials, let's impregnate it with low index materials. And the best low index material we know is air. It has an index of one, and it has no absorption. And so we're going to take a high index medium and just impregnate it with a bunch of air bubbles. What we're going to use as our high index medium is Kapton. It's a polyimide material. You start with this material polyamic acid. It's a precursor. You then imidize it to get this ring closing of this nitrogen moiety, and you make polyimide. That imidization happens at quite high temperatures. That's what makes polyimide such a nicely thermally stable material. It has a high index, so it's about 1.7 uh, index. And these are the emission spectra of the three molecules we're going to use to make a white LED. So we have a blue emitter, perfect molecule, a green emitter, ERPI, and this other red emitter, IRDMPQ-ACAC. I know the, the names are complicated. I'm not even showing you the molecular structures. All you need to know is we have three emitters, which together can produce a white emission pattern. So how do we make this hazy layer? Well, we worked with the group of Professor Craig Arnold in mechanical engineering and PRISM. And what they did was they utilized the process of phase inversion. And so they take this still wet polyamic acid uh, film. So it's still wet in its solvent. Its solvent is NMP. And NMP has the, the nice uh, property that it's miscible with water. However, water is a complete non-solvent for polyamic acid. When you take this wet polyamic acid film, submerge it in water, what happens is the NMP and the water want to equilibrate. And in doing so, when the polyamic acid sees all this water around, it wants to crash out of, out of this, this sort of liquidy, jelly phase of polymer. And it'll make this sort of violent mixing and very porous framework. It's actually the way that, that uh, a lot of filters and membranes are produced. And so here's a picture of one. We have this now very porous framework with a lot of interface between air and polyimide to scatter light. And we see, indeed, this film is very hazy. It's very opaque. Light does not trans transmit through it directly. It always takes a sort of scattered path. Now, if we put this on the backside of a substrate, so I should highlight here that we're still working with a glass substrate. And what we're doing is we're just putting uh, selectively this porous polyimide layer on the backside, we can see that doing that does not change our current versus voltage curve at all. And that makes sense. This is our active device. So here's our red emitter, our blue emitter, and our green emitter. Uh, and I should highlight how thin those layers are because I already promised you I would do so. So that's a 6 nanometer layer, a 4 nanometer layer, and a 6 nanometer layer. So we take all of these, these layers stack here, and the device is this part. So this thing is on the outside, on the back side of the device. It's essentially a diffuser. And so that has no impact on the current versus voltage response of the device, but it has a very large impact on the amount of light that gets out. So here we see the device with that porous layer has much more light at a corresponding voltage point than the device without it. And we can, we can show that as a function of the quantum efficiency. So this is the number of photons per out of the structure per incident electron hole pair. And we see that we get a boost of about 60% of external quantum efficiency just by placing this simple scattering layer on the back side of the substrate. Uh, and a corresponding boost to the power efficiency as well. Uh, so a 60% improvement in EQE and about a 78% improvement in power efficiency. What happens to the spectrum? So again, these are very thin layers. And very thin layers tend to breed things called optical interference effects, where you have in, uh, an incident wave and a reflected wave that interfere with each other, either constructively or destructively. And when you change the angle, you're essentially changing the length of the cavity that your eye is seeing. And so when you do that in this structure here, without the porous polyimid layer, we see that stuff shifts. This peak goes up, this peak comes to the blue shift. Uh, whereas when we have this scattering layer, we see that the the emission pattern stays the same, which is what you want for a light. You don't want to, to move around a, a room and have your, somehow the, the lighting change. It's not really an optimal situation. You want to have the lighting stay constant as a function of a viewing angle and position. Um, and so here's a picture of one of these devices emitting. So each of these fingers is sort of a, a pixel. And we see that this single pixel that's emitted actually emits a very broad beam of light. And that's because the, the light is being diffused by this scattering layer. And in so doing, we're getting a lot more light 
out light that would have ordinarily gone to the sides of this substrate, as I showed you before. We're taking this to the next stage, again with working with uh, Craig Arnold, and now just trying to incorporate this device fully on a flexible substrate. So we don't want to play around with this glass substrate anymore. We only did it as a first start to, to try to understand the, the role that this layer plays. But ideally, we want to move to a completely flexible system. And so I'll just show a video of one of those. Um, so we, we made some devices directly on this polyimid substrate. And Craig Arnold group is, is good at using silver nanowires to make a transparent conducting layer. And so this is a, an example of this middle device here. It emits green. We only have a green emitter. But you see that we can bend it, we can flex it. And if we put that one now with this porous polyimid layer on the back, we can see about a 90% boost. And that's a boost because now we have a totally index matched layer between the polyimid substrate and the polyimid scattering layer. We don't have an index contrast between the glass and the polymer. So now I'm going to switch gears, stop talking about lighting, talk a little bit about, about solar, uh, but in fact through the lens of actually telling you a story about how to control grain size in semiconductors. So a grain is essentially, uh, Lynn will probably cringe, and he's here, um, a grain is essentially a crystal light that in, in our view here sits on a thin film. And the, the grains you can see in this metal halide perovskite film are very clear, right? They're very large. They, they span probably a few microns in size. The grains in typical organic semiconductor films, if they're polycrystalline, are very small in size. They're typically tens of nanometers in size. If we want to use these films for solar cells, solar cells love large grains. Better transport, you have less recombination. It's a great thing. However, LEDs and the devices I talked about before don't love large grains. It's a little harder to confine where the recombination is exactly going to occur. Because if you have a grain of a few microns, it's very hard to envision making a 30 nanometer thick film out of that. And so that's a bit the challenge. So we want to try to make use of these organic semiconductors for PVs. So we're going to find ways to increase grain size. And then the metal halide perovskites, which I'll tell you about next, are the sort of um, they're very highly investigated right now for solar cells, but we want to try to think, can we use them for LEDs? So can we make these grain sizes smaller? So that's what I'll, what I'll tell you about the rest of this talk. So I already told you, the, these layers are pretty typical of polycrystalline organic thin films, but it would be nice if we could find a way to work with films that look something like this. And so here we are able to make grains of hundreds of microns instead of tens of nanometers. And we want to try to understand what happens to a device when we make films like this. And if you want a little more information, uh, Mike Fusella and Lisa Lin are both giving posters with uh, relevance to things like this. Uh, as a spoiler alert, I'm not actually going to talk about Lisa's work in this presentation, so definitely go see her poster. Also see Mike's if you want much more detailed physics about what I'm going to show in the next 10 slides. So in in trying to establish what happens when we go to these very large levels of, of large grain size, um, I first need to introduce a couple concepts about an organic solar cell. So first is that an organic solar cell is unique in the solar cell world. In a typical solar cell, you have an absorber, and we take for granted that a photon that is absorbed into that semiconductor directly forms a free electron and a free hole. In an organic semiconductor, that's not true. The absorption of a photon creates a tightly bound exciton, which is an excited state of that molecule. It consists of an electron and hole, but they're tightly bound. You can't rip them apart directly. And you have to use two materials, not one, to make photocurrent flow. So we have this donor-acceptor interface. The donor that donates an electron, the acceptor that accepts an electron. And this provides the energy to split that exciton into a free electron and a free hole. The problem is this costs energy. And the question that we're trying to ask is, is there a way around that? We try to design materials that can perhaps overcome this energy loss mechanism. And so we looked at rubrine because it's known to have some pretty interesting characteristics. Band-like charge transport, I'll explain that in a moment. Um, and the exciton can move and travel very long distances, two to eight microns, numbers that are rather unheard of in organic semiconductor lingo. The problem is these measurements were done on bulk crystals like this, not on thin films. 
And so how do we make thin films with this level of grain size? It's actually quite simple. Um, we just take an amorphous film of rubrine, stick it on a hot plate at the right temperature, in this case about 150 degrees Celsius, and we transform it to a film like that. And because this film is a bit too thin to absorb much light, we stick it back in our vacuum chamber and take a page out of 3.5 semiconductors and just perform epitaxy on that film and make it as thick as we want. So we stick it back in the vacuum chamber, evaporate more rubrine on top, and we can see that rubrine just propagates that growth. And so we're doing a little bit of work trying to understand the growth of these films, understand their formation. Um, and now I'm going to show you some pretty pictures that, that Mike took on the atom atomic force micro microscope looking at the epitaxial evolution of these films as a function of thickness. So here's that very smooth template, and we can see that as we start depositing material on it, our material follows a sort of uh, very much layer by layer type growth mode, which is ideal in epitaxial uh, growth in that the roughness does not substantially increase. We go from you know, practically zero roughness here to I think only a few nanometer RMS roughness in, in this one that's 100 nanometers thick. And the other intriguing part about this is, and this is work we've done with, with Lin Lu at, in chemical engineering, is these templates of rubrine have a very specific orientation to them. So this is looking at the x-ray uh, scattering, so the diffraction pattern of x-rays hitting this sample, and we see very specific points in this diffraction pattern. And that means that rubrine is oriented in a very specific way. The other thing that's interesting is when we deposit C60 on a typical non-interacting type substrate like glass, we get a diffraction pattern that looks like this, a series of concentric rings. What those rings mean are that we have these crystallites, they're very small, and they have no particular orientation. They're random in the X and Y and Z plane. Uh, and so that's what this type of uh, pattern means. When we deposit C60 on this rubrine template, we can see a very different situation. C60 adopts very specific orientation. So anything that's marked with red is a C60 diffraction event. Anything marked with white is a rubrine diffraction event. And so we've made a sort of very prototypical single crystalline heterojunction between rubrine and C60. That's our donor acceptor heterojunction. Um, here's what it looks like in real space, not in uh, X-ray diffraction space. And if we start depositing C60 on top of rubrine, we see C60 nicely decorates these molecular terraces of the template of rubrine underneath, but also forms these nice large triangular uh, nuclei, which resemble quite well the equilibrium shape of a C60 crystal. As we zoom out, uh, we can see that the very nice microscope images really tracing out these molecular terraces and they're nicely in these sort of concentric uh, a spiral pattern from a center. And we can even get greedy and do a 25 by 25 micron image as well. Uh, if we go a little bit thicker, so now this is 5 nanometers of C60 on rubrine, we see that the, the size of these nuclei have pretty much terminated to a few hundred nanometers in the lateral direction. And now they're just growing up. And so the, the vertical direction, which defines our device, is essentially a crystal of rubrine and a crystal of C60. When we do that, we see the following for the absorption and the emission of that interface. So the absorption of the amorphous uh, rubrine C60 heterojunction, you have the absorption feature here, this parabola, and you have the emission with a peak that is well shifted from that absorption edge, so this is the absorption peak. You have this energy shift and this corresponding energy loss of a few hundred milli electron volts. In the case of the crystal planar heterojunction between rubrine and C60, here is the absorption edge, and here is the emission edge. They actually align perfectly. And this is what you get with band-like semiconductors. In a band-like semiconductor, your absorption and your emission happens at the same energy. Here's a little picture sort of explaining what we, what we think is happening. So in a band-like process, you have absorption and emission at the same energy. In a disordered process that's well known for, uh, for organic semiconductors, we have that the absorption event happens to these higher energies, but it always wants to trickle down to the lowest energy site. And if we think about an analogy of this, 
Traveling on a band like semiconductor is like traveling down this road here, nice and smooth, you can go as fast as you want. But on these typical organic disordered systems, you're traveling on a road that looks something like that. And so it's not a very rosy picture when you want to think about how do I get down this road at the same speed as I could go down that one. And so that's what we think we're, we're showing in this case. Just give me five more minutes, I'll tell you about perovskites. <laughs> so, so in terms of, first, I'll, uh, first I'll, I'll, I'll show the molecular picture of what we're talking about here. Um, so at the molecular level, and this is work that was done by a quantum chemist at MIT, Troy Van Voorhees, and his uh, very uh, skilled graduate student, in the two molecule case, you get a system that looks like this. Your electron and hole are pretty tightly coupled. In the case of our crystal, we get the situation where our hole density has actually extended across many rubrine molecules. And this extended state has the, the capability of this electron and hole being now not very close to each other, but very far from each other, which means coulombic potential energy between those is lower. And that's why we get lower energy loss in this system. So quickly about perovskites and the LEDs we're making with these. Uh, so just to give you a brief introduction, metal halide perovskites are being used and, and very heavily in solar cells. So much so that the efficiencies of these things have skyrocketed to the point where today the efficiency is 22.1%. Put that in perspective, that efficiency is equal to cadmium telluride and just below that of CIGS. And so the efficiency of these things have really skyrocketed in about the last five years. And it's, it's to really impressive levels. But the, the field hasn't converged on a way to make very efficient LEDs with these. And the main reason is these things really like to crystallize. And so we wanted to find a way to suppress that. And through some feat of engineering, we were able to take a film that ordinarily would want to look like that and make it look like that. When we did that, uh, the sort of secret to this is we employ a third compound which is able to terminate these crystallites and stop their growth. And when we did that, efficiencies of the devices, instead of being a few percent, which is what's reported, comes up to about 10%, either for a red iodine perovskite or a green bromine perovskite. The other added benefit of this is that they're nice and stable. The iodine perovskite device with our additive has the same efficiency over a function of storage time of a couple hundred days, uh, whereas the device without that really rapidly dies. And so we're pretty excited about these results and the ability to show that this semiconductor doesn't have merits only for solar cells, but also possibly for LEDs. And with that, I'd like to conclude. Uh, thank my sponsors at uh, DOE's Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Arm, the Solid State Lighting Guys, for the work we did on outcoupling as well as 3M, and the basic energy sciences for the work on the crystals, and DARPA for the work, and DuPont for the work on the perovskite LEDs. And you, of course, for your attention. OK, we have time for a few questions. Over here on the side, we have a play for the mic. My question is, that ideally, you want like to have a crystalline structure on the top with spreading all over uniformly on both layer, say, rubrin and the C60? Is that the ideal situation? Could you, uh, would it be compared for, for example, if you spread single crystal on top of a rubrin and the other one is continuous crystalline matter uh, on the other side, comparing the two, would we be, would it be more desirable? The Actually, it's, it's an interesting question because the, the main desirability of this rubrine C60 heterojunction comes from rubrine. C60, though we can't experimentally check it, Troy Van Voorhees, this quantum chemist at MIT, can calculationally check it. And he found that it's not really important that C60 is a large crystal. It's only important that rubrine is a large crystal. C60, because its orientational de degrees of freedom are nearly infinite, you can go into so many different orientations and you don't have this major problem. But rubrine has a special situation where if you can lock it into this specific crystal structure, you can get it to show these very delocalized states. And so I don't think it's necessary that the full solar cell be crystalline. Probably just one component needs to be. 
Let's say if I melted the rubrin completely and then suddenly freeze it up so that we have a melt, frozen melt, would it be better then? The melt would probably be amorphous, so not necessarily, and I would say unlikely. Um, we actually start essentially from a frozen melt. We start from an amorphous film, and we quickly thermally convert it to a very crystalline film. So the amorphous starting film is not in an ideal state. And I are working with Rob Sokolow on a distillate on solar energy, so I'm a little biased. He's been teaching me a lot, but I'm a little lost um, on what rubrin is, and then maybe you can comment for me on the availability of all these fun and exciting new materials. I mean, as far as silicone goes, I feel like there's a lot of that, but I don't know about this other stuff. Maybe a more <laughs> practical question. So, so rubrin <laughs> is, is a classic hydrocarbon. There's nothing in there but carbon and hydrogen. Um, it is a tetracene backbone, so you have this, these four benzene rings fused together in this acene motif. Uh, interestingly enough, Ellen Williams, ARPA-E representative, she had made some transistors from pentacene, the, the bigger brother of tetracene, so with five benzene rings fused together. Um, this particular molecule, rubrin, is tetraphenyl, so you have four benzene rings on the outskirts. Tetraphenyl tetracene is rubrin. And it's actually not a very exotic molecule, not even a very difficult one to synthesize, though Paul should probably comment on that, not me. Um, but the, the availability and the abundance of these elements is obviously profoundly large. And so that's one of the main reasons to work with organic conjugated systems for, for devices, solar cells, LEDs, et cetera. Ed, why don't we uh, stop there? And uh, let's thank Barry again and all of uh, the day's speakers for uh, a really great session.